¿Vale? Good morning. We'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's service. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with some announcements this morning. Um, we have a few prayer requests. We ask that you pray for everybody um, who is currently managing this ongoing health crisis, as well as all of our frontline workers. I know they're, they've been working tireless, tirelessly um, to make sure everybody is safe. Um, and also pray for the parents at home that that uh, who are homeschooling their kids, that, that they have patience to continue. Um, we do have a few other announcements. Um, there is a Zoom meeting, a prayer Zoom meeting tonight at six. So anybody that wants to take part in that, um, please see, uh, please talk to Tim if you do not know how to get onto the Zoom. Um, so if you would like, if you're interested in that, contact, uh, contact Tim and he can help you out with that. Also, if you ever wanted to help make a difference, um, Obviously, you can send a card or call one person each week outside of your usual circle. Um, it really does, does make a difference. I know Natalie has received a card um, from one of her teachers um, saying that they missed them and it meant a lot to her. So anybody that would like to reach out, you know, look at the directory and, you know, find somebody that you don't normally um, conversate with and, and send them a card. Also, um, if you, while you are sending cards or contacting people, if you haven't already, please reach out to those who don't have internet access um, and just share some of the news that we have on the Zoom meeting with everybody. Um, I know there are some people that don't have the ability to get onto Zoom, um, so we definitely don't want them left out. So if you wouldn't, if, if you happen to be reaching out to people, please remember those as well. Thank you. You got it. <laughs> Good morning, rugby, and everybody else listening. Goodbye. Uh, good morning. If you, I think we got some people from Texas with us this morning, so uh, welcome. We're in John eight, so if you want to get your Bibles out and turn uh, to there, we'll be uh, we'll be studying there. I'm just making sure everything's looking okay on my end here. All right. Clark, can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm gonna assume everything's working okay. Um, John A, there we go. Let's start there. If you remember last week, we're at the we're at the Feast of the Tabernacles. We're right in the middle of that story. We're going to pick up in verse 12. If you remember with the Feast of the Tabernacles, there are two, uh, two different uh, ways of kind of looking at um, uh, that people used in. OK, I'm settled now. Let me start over. Feast of the Tabernacles two main images that they use uh, when they are celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacle. One is the when Moses hit the rock with, and produced water in the wilderness. And so last week, you remember, uh, we talked about living water. This week, uh, Jesus is going to talk about light. Imagine the pillar of fire uh, by, by night and the, uh, the pillar of cloud that led them by day. The idea was that they would know where they were going. So Jesus this week in John 8 is going to pick up on that image. So let's start in verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So remember all the way back to the beginning of John, John 1, 4, 
Jesus, uh, John said this, in him was life and the life was the light of men. So darkness in John is the opposite of light. Walking in darkness is not a direct reference to walking in sin, but rather the absence of life. And John continues to say, there's a different way to, to think and to see and to know. And, and so the question today is what's John really challenging us to do? So we're back to this issue. Who is Jesus? What's John trying to get us to see? So let's pick back up in verse 13. The Pharisees challenged him, meaning Jesus. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. So here's the idea for a testimony to be valid, you had to have a witness. And so they're saying, Jesus, you're just, you're just coming with no authority. We don't know who you are. You can't be your own witness. Verse 14, Jesus says, even if I testify on my behalf, my testimony, testimony is valid. And I really like this next phrase, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. So Jesus says his testimony is not just his. And he's going to build on that idea. He continues, but you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. And so the conclusion is, of course, you do not know who I am. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my, deci my decisions are true. But I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Makes a lot of sense. It's correct thinking. They would identify with that. And so they have to attack it another way. Verse 19, they ask him, where is your father? They're trying to be very literal. They're not understanding that Jesus yet is saying that God had, had sent him. So Jesus answers in, in, in verse 21, once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. And so look at Jesus's argument over the next uh, four verses. He, he uses a, a contrast. He says, where I go, you cannot come. You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And so Jesus is pushing back and showing how he is different from the way they're thinking and the way they're living and the things they think are important. He's looking at something totally different than what they're looking at and therefore his testimony and who he is is it's great is better 25 who are you they ask just what i've been telling you from the beginning jesus replied and through this whole section jesus doesn't appear to be giving them a direct answers but rather indirect answers he is trying to jolt them from their ingrained thinking. He's trying to get them to see something different. It's not that they need a single answer because that's not what they're really asking for. They expect ways, they expect the, the way things are to stay the same and, and they don't even realize who they're following. And so Jesus tries to continue in their own language, in their own way, to convince them of his authority. Look at verse 26. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell the world. So this is not a secret, and this is something that he's broadcasting and something he's trying to change their whole way of thinking. Verse 27 confirms where they're at. They did not understand what he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, 
Then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what pleases him. And even as he spoke, many believed in him. So this was Jesus's purpose all along. I don't think he thought he would get everybody, but some people would begin to see and understand that, that he's not just talking about overthrowing the Romans and making the, the Jews in charge again and giving them all the power. They're beginning to at least glimpse something different. And some are beginning to understand this different way. And so Jesus in verse 31 turns to those Jews, to the Jews that, who had believed in him, and says this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This verse is often taken out of context and used and put on plaques and on buildings and, and sayings. But in this context, he's connecting these people. If you follow me, if you follow my authority, you'll be connected to God. That is the truth. That is life. That is the light of the world, and this truth will set you free. And, and think about how this would begin to excite them. And, you know, even though they had large autonomy under the Romans, the, really, they could only tolerate being totally free in their mind. They didn't want anybody telling them where to go or what to do or what they could do or what they could not do. That seems a little fitting for uh, these days. People today have the, the same uh, thinking. They don't want to be told what to do and where to go and how to do. There's a conflict of wills. And Jesus is not offering them freedom to, to do whatever they want. They're not yet completely understanding the freedom he's offering. So verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? So they get a little insulted. And I want to say, really? Do you not remember Egypt? I, I, weren't you slaves there? And so this picture they have of themselves, the story they're telling, we've never been anyone's slaves, even though the Romans have power over us. We're not their slaves. They don't have an accurate picture of who they are and, and, and what their history is. And so Jesus pushes them. Okay, you're not going to admit to being slaves. Verse 34, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And, and so he's pushing on the side. They would admit that they are uh, sinners. And so to say that they were sinless, that's not something that they would uh, want to do. That wouldn't appear to be right. And, and so hopefully Jesus is getting through and he, they see that he's confronting them on a spiritual level rather than a political one. Everyone sins. You are a slave. Sin brought death. Jesus is saying, I bring life. And he follows up with verse 36. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Again, going to his authority, trying to establish who he is. I am from the father. If you want freedom, I can offer you true freedom. And so Jesus, in trying to get them to see, again, turn things around on them. Rather talking about who he is, now he is pushing on the topic of who they are. And the fact that we are, they were, we are all known by our actions. Verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Wow, what an indictment. I hope that I never get to the place where I have no room to hear something different, particularly when it's coming from God. 
because I will never achieve perfect understanding or perfect seeing. I can improve, I can, I can grow, I can become more like God, but they are yet to see that. Verse 38, I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come from God. I have not come from my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yeah, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Pretty strong words, and Jesus is pushing hard to crack through their thinking and to reach their hearts. And Jesus is saying motivation does matter. Looking like a Jew didn't make you close to God. Being born a Jew didn't save you. You had to make God your father. How we live matters. Of course, they don't like this, and they're going to push back hard when confronted with their own reality, when Jesus holds up the mirror to them, instead of saying, you're right, I need to grow, I need to have God in my heart, I need him to shape who I am, their response is, aren't we right in saying you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? So they're trying to slander, they're trying to insult, they're calling names, they're casting doubt. 49, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaim, now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys, obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the pro prophets. And here it is, coming, screaming, and I, I, I put it bold, and, and you can put it in all caps. Who do you think you are? That's the heart of what John is trying to get us to see. Jesus knows who he is. Will we accept it? The Jews didn't. They rejected it. They pushed back. They were unwilling to see anything different than the way they saw themselves, the way they elevated themselves. They made no room for God in what they were doing. Who do you think you are? Well, Jesus knew. Look at his response in 54. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. 
but I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. <laughs> Jesus is trying to connect to the, to the thought that Abraham looked forward and as much as he was removed but excited about this day, you are now living this day, a time that the Messiah has come to bring you life, to be the light of the world. You should be excited about that. But they still can't see it. They're still being so literal to only the physical things they can see in front of them. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. They're trying to make everything sound ridiculous. They're trying to turn everything around. See, it's not about the truth. It's about discrediting. That's a strategy that's still used today. 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. I don't know how you find this last passage, but it's exhausting. It's like having a political conversation today. It's like nobody's listening. Nobody's really trying to seek the common good or what's best. And Jesus is trying to jar them out of the way they're living and who they're following and what they wanted. See, they had become a political system and you cannot be married to a political system and at the same time be the kingdom of God. You know, they're insulted because they hear what Jesus is saying. If he's before Abraham and he says, I am, you remember what happened at the burning bush and what Moses was told. They, they got all of that imagery. They got all of what Jesus was saying. And so their only response in 59 picked up stones to kill him but they're not in charge and Jesus slips away. So what's John trying to get us to see? I, I have some ideas and some conclusions I wanna to bring together. We must hear the kingdom of God. We must see the kingdom of God. We must be the kingdom of God. And how will we know that? Well, we know how it works. Um, my kids, I can see it in them. They have some of my manners. They use some of my phrases. They, their voice sounds like my voice. Whether I like it or not, I can hear it in them. They act like I taught them to act. Why? Well, they're my children. And obviously, that's what John's trying to get us to see. Are we going to be children of the world and live in darkness? Are we going to be children of God and live and have life in the light? So here's the questions. When people look at us, do they see God? When they see, what, uh, see our lives, do they want what we have? If we understand what Jesus brings us, if we believe in who he is, we will have manna from heaven, even in times of famine. If we understand who Jesus is and we're trying to be like him, we will have living water, even in times of drought. And we will walk in light, even when times seem dark, even in the middle of a pandemic. We will walk in the light as he is in the light. And maybe even in a greater way during those troubled times, we can show those around us. In him, not in us, but in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And then we will hold to these words. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
I think we should understand this freedom at last about what we're free from, but whether what we are free, what we're free to do. Because of Jesus, because of his strength, because of who he is, we are now free to give. We are now free to serve. We are now free to love. We are now at last free to live. Clark's now going to lead us in a celebration of this communion as we, uh, of this freedom as we enjoy communion together. Clark. Good morning, Rugby Avenue. It's great to be worshiping with you again. One of the things we've emphasized in the past is that uh, the communion is a demonstrable confession of our faith. And so I want to read the words of a uh, song that we sometimes sing before communion that uh, is one of my favorites because it's really a beautiful confession of the Christian faith. How we believe things, even though we were not fortunate to be there in the first century and see them with our own eyes. Number 726, we saw thee not. I'm going to omit the repetition uh, of the chorus, but uh, this is a very, a very beautiful hymn, one of my favorites, that takes us from the life of Jesus to the crucifixion, and then the resurrection, and then the ascension into heaven in its four verses. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, forgive, they know not what they do. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We gazed not in the open tomb where once thy mangled body lay, nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angels said, why seek the living with the dead? We walked not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth ascend, who raised to heaven their wondering view, then low to earth all prostrate bend. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the sky. A beautiful reminder that there's so much that we believe in and that we give thanks for the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and that he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God right now, and his presence is here in this worship. Let us give thanks now and remember the sacrifice that he made, beginning with the bread. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, holy is your name. We thank you, Lord, that you are a gracious and loving God, that you would love even sinners such as us. That your Son would leave the glories and bliss of heaven to suffer on this earth, even though he deserved no suffering. But rather, he took our punishment on our behalf. We thank you for this remembrance that we have each week for your wisdom and knowing that we need it and giving it to us. We thank you that your son gave himself up to be nailed to that cross and lifted up on that cross. Help us to remember, Lord, how much we owe you in Christ's name. Amen.
And now for the fruit of the vine, we pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much that your son was willing to shed his blood. We pray, Lord, that you'll cleanse us with the blood of your son. Make us pure, make us what you want us to be. Help us to remember this sacrifice each day of our lives. We thank you, especially that he arose from the dead after giving himself on the cross so that we can have hope of eternal life with you. Help us, Lord, to be your servants each day in gratitude for what you've done for us. In Christ's name. As part of this remembrance, I would like us to remember one of the Messianic Psalms. I'll just read the first verse from Psalm 22, when David said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? And of course, Jesus repeated those words on the cross. At the end of that psalm, David expresses hope again. And of course, Jesus also knew, although he couldn't feel it at the time, probably that there was hope. There's always hope. Sometimes we might feel forsaken when times are difficult. But let's remember, we don't suffer anything right now, even in this trying time that compares with what Jesus willingly suffered. And today we suffer only unwillingly. We have each other. We're never forsaken. We can always reach out to each other. And I encourage everyone at Rugby Avenue, reach out to each other. If you have any needs, let someone know. We are all connected still. I hope, I want to read one last verse of a, of a closing song. It's about meeting in heaven, and I'm certainly hoping that we will meet before then. <laughs> I hope that we will be back together soon. I'm sure that we will. I'm always an optimist. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river, Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. That's our hope for eternity. In the meantime, let's look forward to gathering together again at Rugby Avenue. Thank you so much for your time and your worship together this morning.